here's the truth. Helen tasked me with getting some of the speakers, and you've seen some of them, like Brooke, but uh, the two that I couldn't land that were had conflicts to, for today, one at Virginia Institute of Marine Science and one at the Smithsonian. Uh, so because I couldn't land them, I'm going to give the essence of what I wanted them to talk about. So I'm going to, kind of like Josh, I'm not doing it myself, this is uh, their work. But uh, first of all, the guy that brought me back from Australia, Don Bosch, has been uh, actively uh, tracking sea level rise in Chesapeake Bay. And last year, they published uh, uh, the, the most recent projections of sea level rise for Maryland. And as you can see from the graph, uh, we have instrument data from, uh, from around the turn of the uh, 20th century uh, showing about a foot of sea level rise in the 100 years. And then, they, then we have these projections that are that are um, showing that accelerating accelerated rate. So, so that's something that we've got to deal with, and uh, we see it in downtown Annapolis uh, virtually every week now. Uh, that's the the, um, the sea level in, in Annapolis, and that's the days of nuisance fl flooding reported for downtown Annapolis. So. Anybody going down Compromise Street, you know, it's it's the dr storm drains are coming up uh, all the time now. Compromised. Compromised Street is compromised. <laughs> Good point. And then we get storm surge like Hurricane Isabel 2003. This is Fells Point in Baltimore. So, uh, of course, lots of other low-lying areas. Half of Dorchester County is underwater. We had a whole thing last year about sea level rise. So what do we do? We jack our houses up. But more importantly, what I want to talk about is what we tend to do is harden our shorelines. And this is kind of an insidious, uh, ongoing process uh, baywide. And, you know, when you map it at the baywide scale, we see that we have hardened shorelines uh, uh, extensively on the western shore, Maryland and Virginia, uh, and increasingly on the eastern shore. So this is uh, what you see when you go out on the bay. Uh, that when I went away for, uh, to Australia for 10 years, so my, my big remark when I came back is, wow, the shoreline has changed. This is, used to be marshy, soft shorelines. It's all, uh, it's all changed. It's not just Chesapeake, but the Maryland coastal bays, uh, and, and particularly the north of the Ocean City Inlet, are extensively hardened. Uh, so the guys I wanted to uh, capture uh, the, uh, at the Smithsonian and uh, with a lot of colleagues, including uh, Brooke, um, did uh, a six-year National Science Foundation funded project on the effect of shoreline hardening. And so we captured those talks with an online set of seminars. And if you want to jot this down, this is the website that has those talks. And you can watch the video version of the talk. You can look at the slides or you can make a podcast and listen to it in the car. So you can you have all those different options uh, to watch these talks. And they talked about the impact of shoreline hardening on the nearshore habitats, on the SAV, on the fish and the crab crabs, and, and on fr uh, Phragmites, the you know, invasive uh, common reed. Really good talks. I'll give you the short version if you don't want to spend the 15 minutes for each talk on, on that. So uh, what's happening is uh, the shallow water provides a, a refuge, a nursery for small invertebrates, small crabs and fish. It's because the big, the big ones can't get there, can't get them. Uh, but when you have a bulkhead, you, you don't have that shallow protected area and so plus you generate scour uh, from the reflected waves uh, that uh, serves to um, increase turbidity. Uh, rip wraps a little better for the scour but it still uh, you lose a lot of that shallow water habitat. So shallow water habitat's lost with the hardened shoreline. Uh, in a short version of a long series of slides, I, 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 I I'm calling it birds boycott bulkheads, okay? So it turns out you can you present bulkhead and you, you do this water, water bird commu community integrity where you look at these different species, the, the ones that are sensitive to disturbance, the ones that are tolerant, and you plot that and you show, it shows definitively that bulkheads are not good for, for the birds that we like to see. And, uh, and as Brooke alluded, uh, SAV are sensitive to this. And this is 
a very small threshold, only five, about 5% five riprap in, in a, in a, a sub-estuary, a, tri a, a tributary, will dramatically reduce the SAV in that tributary. So, so that's a real, a real issue. So when you're going through your permitting about, about the hardened shoreline, See if you can talk them into living shorelines or some other alternatives. And there are lots of m in information material available on those alternatives. NOAA and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation have been promoting uh, the, the soft living shoreline uh, examples, and they, they've got all kinds of materials available for, um, for that. And just as an anecdote, you know, after Hurricane Isabel and a lot of the, um, the, the large storm surge associated with that, People with with hardened shorelines had to do a lot of invest a lot of replacement value. The soft shorelines, the water came up, the water came down. Same with the tsunami in, in Indonesia. Soft shorelines are are more resilient for large events as well. Tom Horton um, is a famous uh, writer and, and, and environmentalist, and his buddy Dave Harp here in this kayak. He's actually circumnavigated the Delmarva Peninsula twice by kayak. And 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 he call, he's written blogs about it. It's, and he calls it those those hard shorelines are hostile. You know where to put out. You can't take out. You can't. So um, and and his big observation from his circumnavigation of Delmarva is, oh my goodness, how much the, the shorelines change. That hardened shoreline. So uh, one way we're trying to tackle this is we do these annual report cards. Uh, we've got our report card coming out in about on the 21st of May this year. Um, Last year we had a really good news story. It was the first time the grades had been significantly improving baywide. Seven out of the uh, 15 reporting regions show statistically significantly improving trends in, in, in the, the suite of indicators that we use to make these grades, water quality, seagrass, SAV, um, benthic communities. And, uh, and we're, we're starting to uh, expand that to start talking about things like vulnerability to climate change and, and coastal resilience. And you can see from this diagram that we separated natural vulnerability on the right from human vulnerability. And the natural vulnerability is, is, is that these low-lying habitats like marshes and, and shallow water habitats, they're very vulnerable to changes of sea level. And, and, and the intensified storms and uh, pulsed runoff events we're getting. Uh, and then if we double that natural vulnerability with human uh, impacts, we make the whole, the whole system more vulnerable. So when we think about coastal wetlands and their uh, vulnerability and, and ultimately the resilience to, to bounce back from, from events, we have a less resilient versus a more resilient diagram here. And what we need to be thinking about when we're thinking about uh, salt marshes and shallow water habitats is that they have to be able to migrate inland because sea level is continuing to rise, as you saw from the first slide, and uh, the only way for them to survive is to move up. But if you put a hardened shoreline, there's nowhere to move. There's no, no migration uh, corridor. So we need to think migration corridors. We also need to think about wave dampening. So. Um, so offshore oy uh, oysters, uh, SAV beds serve to very effectively dampen the waves and, and reduce the, the, coast, the erosion that you get associated with uh, the hardened shorelines. And so we've actually mapped and charted uh, what that would look like, our, our resilience in, in our built up area and over here even on the eastern shore, our resilience is, is not very high. Um, we've, we've also reduced the sediment supply, something that Josh was talking about regarding the freshwater, tidal fresh marshes of the Hudson, uh, so we don't have the, the sediment supply anymore, so they, they have to struggle to keep up with sea level rise. And our future uh, forecasting of that resiliency is, is showing some real problems developing both on the eastern and western shores. And part of this is a, is a, is a way to, uh, it's a rethink, and we're, we're actually, I'm working with the Great Barrier Reef program um, on, on this uh, resilience issue as well, because you, you manage, we tend to manage for condition. We manage for, you know, we want, we want marshes, we want birds and habitat and good water quality, 
but increasingly we need to be thinking about managing for resilience because we are going to have these continued insults to, to uh, you know, big storms, big events, as well as uh, climate, uh, you know, the, the slow but steady things like sea level rise. So we have to be thinking about managing for uh, both condition and resilience and trying to maintain ecosystems that can uh, migrate the marshes inland, uh, migrate the SAV inland, uh, have offshore protection like oyster reefs uh, and, and avoid, avoid uh, stopping that migration um, or polluting it. So as Brooke indicated, um, uh, this is coming, coming attractions. We've got a uh, 57 segment uh, of the bay with uh, very specific recommendations. Um, we, we've tracked and broken up the bay and looked at the SAV distribution over time as well as conceptual diagrams explaining the trends and uh, and then the color coded of, of you know attaining, has attained or can attain uh, the target, uh, attainable with with some effort, unattainable. So you know, a little bit of triage here. You so uh, this is uh, this is something that we're we're actively finalizing. Will be done in a couple months. Will be available probably on the DNR website, but certainly on the Chesapeake Bay program website. So let's let me talk about this. Uh, and when we did this uh, synthesis with in the segment analysis, we started looking at the patterns. And one of the patterns was what we're calling this uh, the McMansion uh, fertilized lawn uh, hardened shoreline. And that is the suburban shore syndrome. <laughs> Scientists for a while have been calling it the urban um, stream syndrome, uh, which is when you get all this impervious surfaces uh, and you know Walmart parking lots uh, flowing into the stream and it erodes and digs out the stream. Well, the suburban shore syndrome is where you take these small cottages that uh, with uh, tree-lined uh, with their septic systems and you got the grasses. And, and you, you, you bring in the McMansion and put in the riprap. It means the septic, there's nothing to intercept the, the runoff from the septic and, and, the, and the fertilizer that's making those uh, lawns so green. So this is kind of an insidious and death by a thousand cuts type of issue. Um, the other thing that's going on with shoreline hardening is other climate impacts. And so just looking at SAV, uh, I mean, we've got in increasingly cloudy summers, that's actually made the survey, uh, aerial surveys of SCV more difficult. Increased storminess, more intense storms. Uh, extended our growing season, uh, less snowpack, uh, earlier runoff, uh, extended growing season both spring and fall, and then uh, drought susceptibility in the spring. And then we've got our shoreline hardening, we've got our flashier runoff, our sea level rise, our our marsh erosion, some invasive species, uh, acidification uh, that Brooke mentioned, our plumes with these pulses, increased um, flushing because actually the bay is deeper now, and that means the mouth of the bay allows more tidal prism, and so the bay is actually getting saltier and deeper and warmer, um, and, so, and, and uh, more acidic. So my final uh, couple slides, just because uh, because I can brag about this, this was delivered at lunchtime. Still smell the yeah. still smell the ink. Our UMC strategic initiatives. Uh, we had four initiatives, and are they fit very much what what you're doing? Maintain sustainable landscapes and seascapes. Build coastal resilience. Create healthy urban waterfronts, and finally accelerate the science of changing oceans and climate. So. If you want to have a look at these, uh, I've got a few copies here, and if you want to smell the ink, uh, help yourself. But uh, but you can see that we're we're in the business of trying to figure out ways to do this, and so I like that we have this forum to uh, exchange ideas and and uh, hear 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 back from you, and hopefully with the Mentimeter, we'll direct that back to some of our uh, our researchers to see if we can't get some research to help solve the important challenges that you've got to face today. Thank you. Any questions for Bill? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. I, my one takeaway from this whole thing is this is a societal problem, not a science problem. 
got to tell people not to plant lawns and do all those kind of things that they are doing now. I, I well, I, I think I think that um, let me respond to that in two ways. One is we need social science to go along with the natural science. We need to understand what motivates behavior and, and everything. Secondly, we need the science of restoration, not the science of decay and decline. We need the science of how do we do it better? How do we, how do we uh, track our, our way into the future? How can we grow those oysters smarter and better to get those reefs out there? Um, and that's, you know, what, for those of you on the tour, we saw the billion oyster spat that we produce every year in this in this building is is to help restore the base. So I think we need science, restoration science, and I think we need integrate social science. That's my quick answer to that. One more. Um, is it if somebody has a hardened shoreline, is it realistic or feasible to um, retrofit that to a living shoreline? And if they were to do that, would that be more disruptive to the ecosystem during construction? And is it financially realistic? So a lot of good questions there. I'm not a coastal engineer, so I can't answer the question of whether, you know, what's it cost to retrofit a hard, uh, a, a traditional uh, hardened shoreline to a living shoreline. Um, but uh, I, I, I think that the, you have to be thinking the long term. And I, I think the construction activities, even living shorelines, are disruptive. You know, you, you know those are bulldozers and, you know, they're moving dirt and, and, and such. So, so you're, you're going to have short-term pain for a long-term gain uh, for, for even living shorelines. And I'm not even sure, uh, you know, the, the, the options that are available. I and mean, pretty much bulkheads are or think in the past in terms of construction permits, there's still bulkheads around, but but um, uh, there's there, there's a group we're working with, the World Harbor Project, where they're taking and making uh, the the structure, the hardened structures, uh, with uh, roughened surfaces to allow micro you know organisms to live on them. So they are encouraging growth of of organisms on the the hardened structure. So. Even when you have hardened structures, there, there are smarter ways to do it than, than, than we're typically currently employing. So I think, I think there's a lot of innovation, uh, room for innovation and, and development in that field. Mm -hmm.